So many of you have been supportive of watching my laser videos since I started recording them back in March. In that time, I've taken on a lot of different lasers to test them, review them, and learn everything that I can to pass that information off to you. But one of the things that has remained consistent is people leaving comments or reaching out to me privately to ask what laser is going to work best for them and what they should buy. Unfortunately, it's not an all-in-one kind of thing. I can't tell you, go get this particular laser, it'll do everything you need, because there is no jack-of-all-trades, master of none in the laser world. Whatever machine you decide to go with, you're going to have to give up something in exchange for all of the strengths that it will bring to the table. So in this video, I'm gonna go over the three big types of lasers that you can buy as a consumer, what their strengths are, their weaknesses, and then kind of give you an idea of what you need to do to determine what's best for you and your business or hobby. I'll even give you a handy worksheet to help you make that final decision. So the first thing you're going to want to do is sit down and answer a few key questions about what it is you want to do with that laser. What are the products you want to make? Do you want to make jewelry? Do you want to make signs, home decor, coasters? Do you just want to engrave? Do you need to cut anything that's thicker than a quarter inch? The big question, do you want to work with acrylic? That's clear sheets of plastic for those of you who don't know what the heck that is. The next question you should ask yourself is how much space do you have to dedicate to a laser? Some lasers are bigger than others. Some lasers are gosh diddly darn huge and require half of your garage. And then there are of course some that are portable and very cute but still effective if all you want to do is a little bit of engraving here or there. The third question you should ask yourself is, do you have a way to ventilate any of the smoke and fumes that are going to come off of the laser when it's burning through material? Even if you're just engraving and not cutting, it is going to generate smoke, dust, and fumes that need to be ventilated properly. That means chucking the tube out the window or putting it in an enclosure and hooking it up to an air purification system. And of course, the most important question of all, what is your budget? How much are you personally invested in getting into lasers? Because to be completely honest with you, if you're looking at saving and going below $500, you're probably not going to want to pick this up. Anything that you get that's under $500 is quite likely going to be way too small, which is fine if you want to go small, or dangerous junk. Speaking of which, I should emphasize, lasers are not toys. Lasers can be very dangerous. You need to have proper ventilation and eye protection. If you have children or small pets, you need an enclosure or at least store it in a place where they can't reach it. So those are the basic questions that you have to ask yourself. And of course, they're going to be on the worksheet. You can find a link to that PDF file in the description of the video below. So let's roll into talking about the different kinds of lasers that you can purchase and what they're good for. There are three key kinds of lasers that you can purchase as a consumer. First, you have a diode laser, then you have a CO2 laser, and finally, you have fiber lasers. We'll start with diode lasers because they tend to be the cheaper option and a great beginner option for people who are trying to hop headfirst into lasers. They tend to come in a rail style system. So basically you have an X axis, a Y axis down the middle, and then of course the laser head moving up and down, which would be your Z. They usually come unassembled, so you have to piece them together. Size wise, they're actually not too big, usually about 400 by 400 millimeters. But don't feel like you're limited to that size because oftentimes the brands that make these lasers will also offer some kind of riser or conveyor belt system so that you can do larger items. They do tend to be a little less powerful. So the highest that I've seen for a diode laser is about 40 watts. If you wanna cut anything, you probably need to move up to at least a 10 or 20 watt laser because otherwise you're gonna have to crank that power up to 100% to ram through any material. Speaking of materials, diode lasers can engrave wood, MDF, leather, leatherette, stainless steel, 
fabric, solid black acrylic, anodized aluminum, stone, paper, cardboard, and glass. It's super important to point out that you absolutely cannot cut a PVC-based vinyl or material. On the flip side, diode lasers can actually cut wood, MDF, leather, leatherettes, fabric, solid black acrylic, paper, and cardboard. What you can't do with a diode laser is cut or etch anything that is clear. This is doubly true for acrylics, although there are some really cool hacks to get a diode laser to etch glass. So if you're looking to do really cute things with clear or glitter or mirror acrylics, a diode laser is just not going to work for you. And that's just because of the type of laser that it is. Diode lasers are blue light lasers. So they're not going to pass through due to the wavelength that they project. Now, because of the rail style system and the price point, typically diode lasers aren't going to come pre-enclosed. That means they're going to be completely wide open and you can see the laser working right there in front of you. So usually they come with protective glasses, but I still kind of advise that if people are going to be doing this on the regular, that they get some kind of enclosure. Also, they don't typically come with built-in air assist like a CO2 laser would, so you'll have to add that on. I will say though that a lot of companies are starting to come around to pre-installing a sort of enclosure. The Xtool S1 is right behind me there and it's fully enclosed. So the thing is like, depending on if you want to cut or not, then you probably need to add on the honeycomb tray and a table protector. So you can see where I'm going with this is like the price point starts fairly reasonable, but can start to pile up as you need to add more things on in order to bring a diode laser up to all the accessories and things that you need to do whatever a CO2 would do out of the box. They do happen to be a little slower, uh, at least from a traditional perspective. But that said, a lot of the diode lasers not only are coming in close now, but they're doing speeds up to 600 millimeters per second, which is pretty good. I don't typically engrave higher than that anyway. Now, as far as engraving goes, diode lasers are really good at that. What they're doing is chipping away at the material instead of obliterating it the way that a CO2 laser is going to do. Not only that, but since they tend to be on the lower end for power, they have a smaller precision dot and can give you high detailed results. In fact, I outright refuse to do any leatherette projects on my CO2 laser anymore. I only use the diode. Now let's spend some time talking about CO2 lasers. CO2 lasers tend to be on the larger side. They come fully enclosed because they're using tubes to basically project a laser by using mirrors to get it from one end of the machine to the other where the laser head is located. There are two options when it comes to tubes for CO2 lasers. The first one is a metal RF tube, which tends to be a bit more expensive, but it lasts longer. The second option is a glass tube, which is what I have. And that glass tube is filled with distilled water or antifreeze. They tend to come in higher powers, but they don't last as long. That said, it's totally a known thing that you're going to have to replace lenses and your laser tube eventually. I mean, at the rate that I use my laser, it's probably gonna be another two years before I have to worry about that. So of course, since everything has to be fully enclosed to protect the laser and yourself from all of the mirrors, these things tend to be pretty big. Not only are they big, they're heavy. So when you hear about these desktop lasers, that's pretty much what you're hearing about is like the Glowforge, the Omtech Polar, the GWIC Cloud, or the Xtool P2. They tend to have a working area size of 20 inches wide by 12 inches deep. Now it doesn't sound all that big, but these suckers are easily 200 pounds. And of course, like any laser, they do require proper ventilation, but most of them come with an inline duct fan so it can suck all that crap out of there and then you can chuck the tube out a window. And unlike diode lasers, you can actually get these things to be as big as 63 inches wide or more. Now, my larger CO2 laser is a 35 inch wide bed and sometimes I do feel limited by that. Very few times, like when I'm making tombstones for my front yard. 
That said, a lot of these lasers, even though they're fully enclosed, the CO2 lasers will come with a pass-through option that allows you to pass thinner materials through if you need a longer project, like a sign or a tombstone. Okay, so let's talk about the materials that a CO2 laser can process. A CO2 laser is going to be able to engrave wood, MDF, leather, leatherettes, fabric, again, not PVC, acrylics, anodized aluminum, powder-coated metals, stone, paper, cardboard, and glass. As far as cutting goes, you can cut wood, MDF, leather, leatherettes, fabric, not PVC, acrylics, paper, and cardboard. Really, the takeaway that you need on the differences between a CO2 and a diode is that CO2 lasers are able to engrave and cut transparent materials. This includes clear, frosted glitter, or mirror acrylics. That said, they can't mark metals the same way that a diode can. In order to mark stainless steel, you need to buy a specialized spray, and I really don't like the results of it at all. In fact, the few times I've tried to dial it in correctly, it didn't seem consistent with the results, and the marking basically washed off whenever I went to clean the tumbler. Now, I did gloss over this a bit earlier with the diode, but the engraving that's done on a CO2 laser is basically melting the surface. Well, melting and burning, I guess, depending on what the material is. Since they are higher in wattage, usually 40 watt or higher, that also means that the precision that they have at the dot is going to be a little bigger than what you would find on a diode laser. This means that your detailed engravings aren't going to be as detailed on a CO2 laser as they would be for a diode. This doesn't mean they can't engrave, it just means that you probably should tamper down your expectations on how much detail you're gonna crank out of a CO2 if you're engraving things like pictures of your dog. And you can do higher speeds on these more industrial looking CO2 lasers. For example, my Thunder Nova 35 can probably crank it out at a thousand millimeters per second. But do I go that fast? Heck no. Just remember, the faster you go, the less space you have to work with because it's basically swinging like a pendulum and just going bzz, bzz, bzz. And so in order to kick up those speeds, physics. Just take your science class. Now for the third and final laser type, fiber. Fiber lasers, I don't really have a lot of experience with them. I just know what they are. So take this part with a grain of salt. Fiber lasers are basically what you need to mark metal. And yes, a diode laser can mark stainless steel and anodized aluminum and make really good engravings on those materials. They're not gonna get deep enough to make it a really impactful engraving. If you wanna go like as deep as a millimeter or more, you're going to need to get yourself a proper fiber laser. And I mean 20 watt or 40 watt, somewhere in there. And as far as the wattage goes, you can do challenge coins with a 20 watt, but it's gonna take hours. Whereas with the 40 watt, it'll take less hours. They do tend to be super expensive, several thousand dollars. And I mean like the one I was looking at and backed hard off on is about $10,000. Unlike a diode or CO2 laser, a fiber laser is going to have a galvo system, meaning it's going to have two laser beams that are basically going like an alien ship and it doesn't move. Now that said, there are some Galvo lasers that are diodes, like the Laser Pecker series. Actually, that's a really good segue into what I would actually consider to be like a fourth category of lasers. Micro lasers. They're so small, they're so cute, but they're not toys. These smaller lasers can be cheaper. They're basically meant to be portable to allow you to take them to places like craft fairs. They have an extremely limited space. And I'm thinking like four inches by four inches for a work area. But if all you wanna do is offer a little bit of a personalized engraving or maybe do one-off projects, that might be the place where you wanna start. And then you can become one of us and have 20 lasers. If you look at the description area below the video, you'll find a link to a PDF worksheet I created. This worksheet has a series of questions regarding your goals for laser work, followed by a guide on which laser will work best for you based on the answers you gave. 
The point of the worksheet isn't to try to sell you a laser, but to help you organize your thoughts and get everything together so you can make an educated decision on what you actually need based on your goals, your space, and life. Now, I'm recording this in November of 2023, which means that the prices may have changed. There might be different lasers, blah, 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 but the worksheet will still help you. And then you can do more research on YouTube or just the World Wide Web in general. Thank you so much for paying attention. I hope that this video was helpful. Please let me know if you have further questions because I can do breakout videos to cover those specific points and provide clarity to your laser journey. Thank you very, very much and have a great day.